So I'm just going to describe, to talk, sort of introduce myself and what, who I am and what I do, and, gen, and before I get into this huge subject of what is Jewish art. So I am a Jewish educator and I'm also an artist. Um, I normally teach adults, um, kind of in adult, Jewish adult education, and my artwork also investigates and has a relationship with traditional Jewish texts and tradition. And I see my artwork as this coming together of the traditional Jewish learning and the art studio. And it's not like I, in my traditional Jewish learning, so I'll study these kind of rabbinic texts or biblical texts kind of through the, that particular lens. And I sort of study these, um, these texts. And as I study them, I begin to get a bit of an itch of an idea, a bit of a scratch, nothing particularly fully formed, but it kind of something bothers me, it buzzes, it bothers me. I am, I'm in my studio and I start to make my work. And as my hands are busy, and those of you who kind of knit and crochet and sew and embroider know this, like when our hands are busy, our minds think differently. And it's the thinking, it's the drawing, and it's the make, and, it, and it's the sewing, and it's the making that is part of a thinking process. And for me, these two things go really hand in hand. My Jewish learning and my art making, they're part of the same process. And I have here on the first slide just a few little thumbnails of kind of bits of details of projects that I've done, be they sort of drawing and paint and um, oh, it's painting, drawing, embroidery, there's some print making, um, there's paper cuts there, a very kind of traditional Jewish art form, um, and then another sort of red thread embroidery over there. All of these things, and they kind of have a very similar kind of feel to them in terms of like, I like the kind of meticulous making, that kind of close attention to detail, which also echoes the close reading of the text, um, which is very prevalent in Jewish traditional learning, that kind of very close reading. Um, but also, when I, I often incorporate text in my work, but when I do, it's in my handwriting. So I don't usually use calligraphy or the kind of the scribal arts, which is a very kind of particular art form within the Jewish within within Jewish which is used in Jewish ritual objects. I don't usually use that. Instead I use handwriting. I use handwriting both in Hebrew and in English. Because there's something about when the hand is writing it, it be, it becomes a sense of ownership. And it becomes a sense of it's entered into my world, into my notebook, into my art studio, and I can play and create. Because a lot of this is about taking ownership of this thing, of this Jewish heritage, this Jewish tradition of which I have inherited and making it my own. And something that we own, we can play with. We don't go into our neighbours' houses and start making pyramids of their cups of tea or kind of start going to the museum and start rearranging the <laughs> objects. We would be chucked out if we did and our neighbours would stop talking to us quite rightly and think us a bit odd. But we can do that with the objects in our own home and if we chip and break them, oh well, we can replace them because they're ours and we can play with them. And that is what I do with kind of my heritage. It is something I play with and create and hopefully bring together. But this is actually quite unusual, and it is quite, about 100 years or so, it would have been very odd to have me speak about this subject, not just because I'm a woman, and um, it's only really been recently in the last 100 years there's been huge changes for women within the Jewish world in terms of education and kind of learning at a high level, but also this understanding of what is this whole world called Jewish art. And I'm going to quote from the 1906 Encyclopedia Judaica. Um, and they say, it is, however, somewhat incorrect to speak of Jewish art, where the biblical, post-biblical times, Jewish workmanship was influenced, no, not if not altogether guided by non-Jewish art. Um, as a matter of fact, for none more than, um, for more potent than the law, was the spirit of Jewish faith in putting a check on the plastic arts. It argues that there is really no such thing as Jewish art. There is within Jewish law an internal kind of understanding um, to stay away from the plastic arts. Um, thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> so 100 years or so, that would have been the presentation. Um, and that would have been the presentation because that was the understanding of Jewish art. It was heavily influenced by German philosophy, which had the notion of that Judaism was a culture of the ear and Greek culture was a culture of the eye. 
So Jewish culture was one that elevated poetry and music, and Greek culture had art and architecture, and the two don't really go together. And whether or not this was said as a positive thing, as argued by various um, German um, philosophers, or it was also used to criticise Jews. And I've got a lovely quote here. Uh, actually, can I have the next slide while I read the next quote? Thank you. Uh, so this is a quote from, from Wagner. Um, so this is not such a nice thing to say about the Jews. It's from Wagner. Um, and talks about the sensory capacities for sight belonging to the Jews was never such as to allow them to produce visual artists. Their eyes are preoccupied with matters much more practical than beauty and the spiritual content of things in the phenomenal world. And then he goes on, to the best of his knowledge, there have never been any really good Jewish artists uh, because um, the Jews' eyes are not capable of being able to perceive the spiritual in that way. And it's this idea, but it's again, they have this idea of faith and the art, and somehow the Jewishness kind of stops the faith accessing the art, the Jewish faith. And it's why I was quite intrigued by these titles of this thing, saying the art of faith, and what is the relationship of faith in the role of art. And I see the word faith as being one of deeply personal. I know it's kind of has different, re it has different sounding to a Christian ear, to a Jewish ear, the faith. But to me, the, the word faith means that it's not like being Jewish and be as in, in terms of Jewish art as part of an ethnic category, in terms of belonging to a Jewish culture, a Jewish people, which it is, but also the word faith is more about well, what is my personal relationship with how I perceive God and the spiritual in this world, and how much am I influenced or how do I use my heritage to guide me to perceive meaning in the world? Maybe it's, and it's maybe not the only voice, Maybe it's a loud voice, maybe it's a quiet voice, maybe it's a voice I often argue with, I do. But mm -hmm. it's a voice that's there and it's about how do I as an individual in this world create meaning? And that's, for me, I think is the <laughs> word the, what echoes when I hear the word faith. So both kind of positively and negatively, we have about, coming from about 100 years ago, this idea that actually there's something about the Jewish faith that puts a block to engaging visually in the world. Now, um, Actually, count, um, this comes, there's this kind of tradition of this, but actually, it's not a very long, long tradition. Um, Carmen Bland, in his um, unfortunate name for somebody who writes about art, his surname is Bland, but um, he writes in his book, The Artless Jew, um, that this understanding of the eye and the ear culture is a misreading and a misunderstanding of actually rabbinic Jewish culture. Um, and it is, and it comes sort of externally, and some Jewish German philosophers internalised it. But rather, when you start looking at rabbinic literature, you actually see something very different with regards to their engagement with the visual. Um, and he posits uh, that it's much more sociological, that we don't find many Jewish artists. It's much more to do with the restriction of guilds. I mean, we're here in this exhibition, we see Sir David Salmon managed to get through one of, his, one of the restrictions in his time about what Jews were and weren't allowed to do. So the guilds were very controlled because the guilds were making artwork primarily for the church and it was in the service of religion and so it was inappropriate to allow people who do not share that faith to make the articles in that way. So it's much more to do with that sort of sociological thing than it is to do with anything deeper than that. Um, and, so, and also the, the rabbinic um, world is a world where you take a line and you play with it. You kind of, you contort it, you play with it. And that level of interpretation is missing from saying, well, look, this is what it says in the Ten Commandments. So clearly, that's what it means. Can I have the next slide, please? So here we have the Second Commandment. And actually, here is there where you have a kind of theological difference. Because the commandments are laid out differently depending on what different religion and nomination you are. Uh, for the Jewish, uh, for the kind of Talmudic, and it's really kind of the Talmudic rabbis, they interpret the second commandment like this. And they say, it's, you shall have no other gods besides me. You shall not make yourself a sculptured image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. So that is how the Talmudic rabbis punctuate this. And as we know, punctuation is key because this is not how it's punctuated in other faith traditions. In other ones, you have a little pause here. So you shall have no other gods apart from me, and you should not make for yourself 
uh, any sculptured images are actually two separate, belong in two separate clauses, but the Talmudic rabbis, it's the same one. And so when you start looking at rabbinic Judaism, which is earlier than the German Jewish philosophers who said the eye, the ear separation, when you start looking at those early rabbinic texts, they don't make those separations at all. But rather for them, making a sculptured image, being involved in the plastic arts, is all about idolatry. And that you shouldn't be involved in making idols and you shouldn't be involved in worshipping idols. And that is the rabbinic understanding of the second commandment. And so this whole kind of Jews don't have a visual culture or are iconoclastic because of the second commandment is a sort of, it's not accessing that whole area of rabbinic thought. It's accessing a kind of German Jewish philosophy, but it's not accessing the whole area of rabbinic thought which Cameron Bland wants to put back into this kind of understanding of what is Jewish art. Um, and so it's linked with idolatry. But it's also linked with idolatry in terms of the rabbinic text in a different way. Um, as I said, the kind of the guilds, um, sort of the medieval guilds, and then coming out of that later into the Renaissance, the main patron or main people kind of commissioning to make art was the church. And it was making art in service of that. And therefore, that was considered, depending on what the relationship between the Jews and the Christians of that time were, and all over Jewish Europe, it was different in different places at different times. You can't kind of be a bit too generous about it. But there was sometimes friendliness, sometimes suspicion, sometimes quite, a, quite outright kind of, kind of, uh, sort of oppression and, and, and seeing them very much as other. Um, this is in terms of the Jewish people kind of understanding about Christian practices. And they, they would have been... Uh, there would have been a, a strong compulsion not to enter a church, not to be involved in, not in the Christian world, not because of it's full of art uh, in that way, but rather that they were suspicious about, how, about what was going on and, and, and about that other religion. As I said, it's not true throughout Europe, throughout the whole of the medieval period. There are times when actually they find very interesting relationships going on between Jews and Christians, and you actually have the discussion of various artefacts in rabbinic texts. Um, so they did know about what was going on on the walls of the street, in, as well as in, and, uh, inside the churches, as well as on the walls of the street. So I just want to kind of prick that bubble in case anybody had any kind of came with, oh, I didn't think there was such a thing as Jewish art, and definitely to counter the kind of attitude that was there in that, six, in that 1906 encyclopedia saying there is no such thing as Jewish art. It's often cited because of a reading of this. But rabbinic readings, as I said, is like you have one verse, you read it one way, you read it another, you read it a third way. You read, you reread, you play, you churn it, you churn it, and more worlds expand because of it. And that is the rabbinic um, project. I want to get into the next slide, please. So generally, what is Jewish art is normally answered in a very long, complicated version of this sentence, which is Jewish art is art made by Jews, or it's art made for Jews, or it's art made about Jewish life and describing Jewish li uh, lifestyle. Um, and I'm kind of going to take these sort of broad headings, but they sort of merge into one. So if you forgive me, I'm not going to kind of go, oh, we're now on the this bit, because it will kind of merge into one. Okay, the next slide, please. So I thought I, you have to start with Marc Chagall, a okay, Russian Jewish artist. Um, and actually, Marc Chagall wanted, desperately wanted there to be a definition of what is Jewish art. Um, I have a quote here from him, and he says, Well, I'm not a Jew. I would not be an artist at all, or I'd be someone else altogether. I know quite well what this small, small people can accomplish. When it wished, it brought forth Christ and Christianity. When it wanted, it produced Marx and socialism. Can it not be then it would not show the world some sort of art? Kill me if not. Okay, it's a bit dramatic. Um, but he was searching and wanting to come for a definition, a Jewish art. He wanted that to be there on the world stage. Um, and this is a er relatively early piece of his called I and the Village. And it's this beautiful, quite kind of almost naive kind of thing of everyday life kind of in his village. I, I think at this time he wasn't living in that village at the time. And it's, and it's often kind of, yes, he's often sort of seen as folk art in that way. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm going to show you this sort of drawing. This is actually a pencil and gouache drawing on paper. This is made much later, 1945, sort of coming to the end of the Second World War, very aware of the horrors 
of what have happened to the Jews. He's used the um, Christ figure to express suffering and Jewish suffering several times. It's no longer kind of a shock that he does that. But what is shocking in terms of how he does this in this kind of raw drawing, it's a very beautiful drawing, it's something about this big, it's, it's now in the collect Ben Uri collection in London. I think it's on show at the moment in Somerset House, um, where they ha have this show. Um, and what is interesting about this, unlike some of his other crucifixes, he's actually also incorporated um, articles of Jewish ritual. As I said, like Ju it, Jewish art sometimes describes it's art about Jewish life or uses Jewish ritual objects in there. And here you have on the head and on the arm are these leather boxes and leather straps that men wear during prayer. They're very, very particular. I don't know if any of you have seen a Jewish man in prayer wearing these boxes. It's a very particular thing you can kind of... And also you know where men have, because like in, in the morning if they have, they kind of leave an impression on their skin and their hair, especially if they've sort of showered just before and it's, they've got slightly wet hair. Uh, but, they, but when you see that, that is not just a kind of crucified... That's not just a kind of Christ on the cross suffering, but that is a religious Jewish man who is involved in the act of prayer suffering. So he's involved in the act of having a relationship, a dialogue with God who is suffering. Um, I mean, there's plenty to say about the kind of the time running out, the family, look what's happened to the village, that beautiful village he kind of put with all the kind of the colourful paintings, it's like it's been destroyed, has been destroyed there. And this appropriation of Christian iconography, um, some people read this as quite subversive, but I think for him, that's the lexicon. That's the lexicon of art that, that has that this is a symbol of suffering. And this is the thing that struck home most to him. And we see quite a lot of kind of Jew, in Jewish art, or art made by Jews, this appropriation of, Jew, of, of symbolism that is normally, of, of Christian symbolism. I was about to say symbolism that's normally associated with Christianity, but actually, no, it really is kind of Christian symbolism. Okay, have the next slide, please. I'm going to get sort of fast forward a bit. This is um, a lot of the Jewish artists in Europe. There are a lot of the, that sort of moved to America, and the heart of it went to America. And this is a particular artist that I was very uh, struck by when I was at art school, kind of finding out about him. And this is Barnett Newman, the abstract expression, American expressionist. Um, these are called the state, his Stations of the Cross. Again, appropriating um, a Christian kind of title there for these series of paintings with these sort of white canvases with these strips. He talks about these zips that he has going down. And he's written elsewhere about a slightly different series, also with these strips of colour about the, sort of the moment of creation. And um, when I was at art school reading his writings, I was also doing my traditional Jewish learning, and it, he echoed so much some of the freight, not the freight, the concepts that I was learning about about creativity, about God creating something from nothing, about that moment, that split-second moment. Um, and this particular series struck me, um, although I sort of did a bit of research, I couldn't really find it, of this, this echoed for me the black and white stripes of the prayer garment called the talit, which is this white garment, often has black stripes going down. Um, and those who are familiar with Jewish ritual life will see a white garment with black stripes and instantly recognise it, it becomes code. And if you don't see it, you're just, if you don't know it, you're still, it's still intriguing. It still holds a power. It still draws you there because there's a kind of, it develops a series. I don't know, and I, as I said, I wasn't sure that he wasn't thinking of the talit when he was doing this. However, Barnett Newman had a traditional Jewish upbringing. He went to kind of the places of the synagogue and he went to all of that. So he knows exactly what a Jewish prayer garment looks like with its white and black stripes. So for him to do this, it's like he must be talking about prayer. There must be something in that. Um, then the next slide, please. I'll go on to Kitai, which this slide has come out horribly technical for some reason. It's not, the actual painting isn't that zoomy. Um, this is Kitai, um, this is in 1980s Kitai. It's a kind of later painting. This is the Jewish rider. Um, for Kitai, being Jewish, he wrote the, sort of his, the Diaspora Manifesto, the Second Diaspora Manifesto, um, and for him, being a Jewish artist is about being the outsider. It's about the being the wandering Jew, the wandering and wondering, the th constantly churning and thinking, never being fully at home anywhere, 
um, and yet kind of but on a way to somewhere. And this is his, I mean, there's another series of portraits of the Jew, the Orientalist, at where he goes, but I, I wanted to pick this because I found this fascinating uh, for various things. So for him, the Jew is on a train. The Jew is travelling. As I said, not settled, not at home, but travelling somewhere. Um, you can't see it. There's a little detail here. In the back, maybe you can. Up here, there's a cross. So the Jew is going past the cross. He's going past it. He's gone past it. He's gone past it. It's there, but, it, but it's in the landscape. He's going past it. Um, and it's quite comfortable, maybe a little bit bothered. There's something, though, a little disturbing about this figure coming along. Um, I was on a train. I think if a ticket inspector had come to inspect my ticket holding a stick like that, I would not feel safe or reassured. But so there's something, there is that threatening presence there. So for Kitai, he was felt, he did feel persecuted. He did feel threatened. He did feel, never felt quite at home. And for, for me, I mean, I, I, I love his stuff, his, his writings, his art in some ways. And in other ways, it fills me with great sadness that he had this out, he held so tightly onto this outsider persecuted status. Um, and it's almost like he, he couldn't be at home in his Jewishness. He had to be a Jew in the presence of the other, but he couldn't really feel at home. Um, and he couldn't really feel at home anywhere. There's, a, there's another painting he has where he's quoting Walter Benjamin about unpacking my library. And actually very few books have been unpacked in this painting of his unpacking my library. And I was like, okay, go. he's not unpacking, he's still ready to move, he's still on the run. So, so, so Kitai, for me, when I was kind of at art school, kind of sort of thinking about this project, how do you bring this Jewish tradition, Jewish heritage together with the art? Um, he was very influential but also fell, filled me with a deep sense of sadness. The next one, please. Okay. And now we move on to, this is Judy Chicago. Um, Judy Chicago, an uh, American artist, feminist artist. This is a permanent installation in the Brooklyn Museum called The Dinner Party. It's a mass, it's a room, a triangular room. And on The Dinner Party, um, we have place settings for various women mythological women, women from the Bible, women from various myths, women who were often overlooked in their narrative, in their, in their culture's narrative. And she's like going, we're not overlooking you. In fact, come sit down. Come, and I've laid a table for you. You are part of this. And there's this, this so the dinner party, and each one has an, and it's, uh, it's a fantastic installation, and it's there, and it kind of, each the sort of care, and like each one kind of needs careful decoding. Um, and it's there as a permanent um, exhibition there in, in the Brooklyn Museum. Um, can I have the next one, please? I want to also show you Elaine Reitschek. She is, um, she's, you know, she's still alive today, she's a contemporary artist. Uh, she's an American Jewish artist. Um, also works a lot with fabric and with embroidery. Um, she did this, um, she did this fantastic um, installation at, the, at MoMA called If you, This You See. Think, uh, sort of taking these samplers. She takes a lot of um, sort of quite misogynist artists, male artists, who uh, and sort of recreates their work in fine needlepoint. Um, but she also kind of has these fantastic quotes about the act of sewing. Because I wanted to show you, show you this and also Judy Chicago, because a lot of the questions about is there a Jewish art form, is there a Jewish heritage of Jewish art, begs the question about, well, what do you call art? Is art, in terms of high art, is art the only kind of the oil paintings that are there kind of in the proper art gallery? Or do we allow, or do we call kind of very finely made craft art as well, art that will be used? So the silversmiths, the embroiderers, the, um, the people who don't sign their names to their work and yet make our world much more beautiful and make our faith much more beautiful and enhance the religious life. Um, be that kind of making the sort of, uh, uh, the, sort of the long tradition of kind of embroidery that's used in the church in churches and also in synagogues that places of prayer are full of the handiwork of people um, who, who have made this and often when we discuss kind of the tradi the art tradition it, we have to kind of we've sort of more and more having to include craft 
and the meticulous making that goes onto the craft and the art form that is. And you have artists like Elaine Reitschek who's taking that form of embroidery and using it and it's very much in an art gallery. These ones. I, I do like this um, quote from Colette. I don't much like my daughter sewing. She's silent and she, why not write it down? The word, the word that frightens me, she is thinking. <laughs> and we can't have anything more dangerous than a woman thinking. Um, so in that way. Uh, we have the next slide, please. Uh, and I'll just sort of change sort of a little bit. Uh, this is the Venice Haggadah. So I've said the art made by Jews. I want to talk a little bit about art made for Jews. Uh, this is the Venice Haggadah. I was recently in Venice um, leading a group of artists on art residency where we were looking at this Haggadah, the 1609 Haggadah, and making um, a new Haggadah. And it's part of a whole project. Next year is going to be 500 years of the ghetto, the, uh, the Venetian ghetto, which actually spawned the word. It was the first ghetto, and it kind of gave the world that word. Um, the word ghetto actually means copper foundry. So um, that's what was originally there in that piece of land. Anyway, um, so this is Venetian Haggadah. And this Haggadah was made, um, it was one of the first printed Haggadah. Before that, the Haggadah, this is a book that was used during Passover for the Passover ritual meal, and it was of, called Seder night. And it has a particular text which you do in order, and the word seder means an order, so it's a quite, there's an order to it. And you have, and this manu, they were, in medieval times came the tradition of having a manuscript. So you have gorgeous, illuminated manuscripts, and this is like the wealthy, only really the wealthy could commission and have these in their homes. Um, they were often not made by Jews, but they were made commissioned by Jews. The um, art historian, Professor Mark, um, my, Mark Michael Epstein of Vassar University points out that even if it wasn't made by Jews, it was made for Jews. And the amount of money it would cost to make a manuscript, and you were the patron, you would want to have a say in what was going on there. You would kind of, I mean, it was a sort of talk about equivalent of kind of like half a million pounds or a million pounds today to create something like that in terms of comparable wealth. I mean, these are very expensive items to make the manuscripts. But this is the printed Haggadah. It's one of the few. It's one of the first few printed. One of the first printed ones, um, and th so that would have had a bit more of a widespread um, distribution. So you would have had. So so more people would have had access to this than the manuscripts. So kind of like the ordinary people, not just the kind of like the sort of the, the very rich. So the kind of the more ordinary Jews would have had this. And what's fascinating about the Venice Haggadah is these little vignettes, and they are tiny little etchings and engravings that sort of show bits that they sort of describe, bits of the story. They're often very interesting commentaries about what is going on in this story. This particular shape here, this triangle, this isn't actually a pyramid there. This is actually Abraham and Sarah's tent that they're talking about there. And I apologise, I, I couldn't find one which really showed it in detail. There's quite a few illustrations in that of a family sitting down discussing the Seder, discussing this book. So in the book is a picture of a family doing what the book is telling them to do. And it's showing them in their contemporary dress of 1609. So it's showing their Jewish life in the text that they're using. So they're seeing themselves reflected in their book. They see themselves reflecting in the work and throughout that there's tiny little engravings and each one of them I could talk phrases about they kind of have they're not just there as decoration as illustration but often they take the meaning of the text and they they push it in all different directions and there's sort of a little argument and tension going on within the illustrations within the work and this is the 1609 Venice Haggadah. Uh, probably so probably not all the printers um, who were involved in this were Jews, but they were formed by Jewish scholars to, to, to make this. And it was one of the first kind of products that, that actually would have been around in many Jewish homes at the time. Thank you. And its influence also, its influence of the Venice Haggadah, kind of you can see in later Haggadah. So this is, I'm going to kind of fast forward in terms of history. This is another object um, made for Jewish life. And this is a 19th century Polish paper cut. Um, very, you can tell it's a Polish paper cut because it has many different colours. It's a very colourful form. Um, the Jewish paper cuts were often made 
by Jewish, actually Jewish Talmud scholars, kind of in their studies, they would have their pairs of scissors and be cutting paper, and they have found old Talmuds from this time with little shards of paper kind of in there, in, in the thing, so they can, so you know that this is what they were doing when they were having a break, or maybe they were like me and they were kind of <coughs> working and studying together, I'm not so unusual after all. Uh, and this is a particularly fine example of the kind of the detail, the layering, and this word Mizrach here means east. And you often find this in a synagogue or a place of prayer because it's this direction towards, towards which the Jews should pray. And you kind of, if you kind of go into somebody's house or if somebody's used to praying three times a day and they don't always want to go to the synagogue and they want to pray on their own, they'll go in and go, okay, which way is Mizra? Which way is East? And they'll kind of, or as my dad sometimes go, okay, which way is God? Which way is God? I'm like, God's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, which way is God? Okay, God's there, fine. And he'll do his thing. So, so this object, this wasn't to be prayed to, so it's not falling into that it's idolatrous, the kind of that, that reading, but rather it's an aid to prayer. It's an aid, it's something beautiful to contemplate, to kind of understand that that's the direction like, of the water face to, in order to pray. And, that's, and you have a lot of examples of a Mizrach, of this sort of, this is where you faced to pray sides. And this is a particularly beautiful one, which is a paper cut, uh, there for, from Poland. I okay, have the next slide, please. And so another example of Jewish life. This is a painting, Jews praying in the synagogue on Yom Kippur, painted by Maurice Gottlieb, a Polish artist. Very sad, he died at age 23, uh, which is really tragic. It's even more tragic when I hear tell you how he died. Uh, because what I find fascinating, mean, this is a painting that I've seen a lot uh, in terms of like Jewish art, and I find it fascinating for lots of different reasons. First of all, it's showing Yom Kippur, it's showing Jews on Yom Kippur, and everyone looks a little bit fed up and bored. Uh, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement, and you spend all day in synagogue, and I know how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's kind of like... Oh, how long have I been? Oh, gosh, you know, when's it over? Like, I, I, know, I know what this feels like. Also, Yom Kippur, you're fasting, you're not eating, so you're feeling weary, you're feeling tired. You've got that kind of way, and it's there, that kind of feeling. But, you know, some people are quite into it and quite spiritual, and he's put them in too. And this is why I love this, because I kind of love looking at the, pe at the faces and kind of trying to think, like, yes, I, I remember what it's like to feel like that. Um, I also like this because it shows men and women, um, unusually. So often when you look for Jewish life or kind of images of Jewish life, uh, you see lots of men doing their men things. And you don't necessarily see the women. Or if they do their women, they're doing their womanly things away. They're maybe lighting candles or, or they're doing something. Of, uh, but they're not really there in the synagogue, in the prayer spaces. Now, they're not in the, exactly the same space. They're in the women's gallery, which is sort of a bit higher. So they are away, but they are... He's put them in as part of the painting. Um, other things to say, I love this little boy here who's wearing a dress. I love, to, I love to think that he's thinking he's wearing a dress. He came wearing a dress again. He's wearing a dress again. Um, but it shows that actually the kind of the colourful clothing that they would have been wearing. This is a, fe this is a very important f festival day. And he's put that in there. And um, Morris Gottlieb was, did these series, or, or started to do these series of paintings in Krakow to show and describe Jewish life in Poland. That's what, that was his aim. Uh, unfortunately, he died at age 23. Um, and the story goes, he died at age 23 of a broken heart. Um, because possibly the other reason why he included, why he put the women in there is because he, was, he had this strong, unrequited love for this woman here, a woman called Laura, who um, he wanted to marry and she turned him down. Um, and she, she actually kind of got engaged to someone else and he um, kind of did lots of quite reckless things, including going out in the snow in the Polish winter and deliberately catching a cold and getting ill and not getting treated and dying. And, and that's why he died. It's, it's very sad. It's, it is very tragic. And actually, this is him. They say that this is him and this is her that, that he put there. And it's a very sad. But I, I do love this painting because it shows 
so much of Jewish life. It shows that love, that romance, that Livy, that you fall in love, you get your heart broken. It's not all about God. It's not all about that. It's also about the kind of the living that goes on. And so you have all of that here in this fabulous painting. Have the next one, please. What's the, the thing, the old man in front of him? Oh, so, so this. Yeah. This is the scroll of the law, the Torah. Um, and it is a, it's a long piece of parchment that has two wooden poles. So it's wrapped round, so it's together. So when it's held like that, but when it's red, it's opened. And it's worn with a sort of garment, a safer Torah, or the cover over it. And there would have been um, a sort of a metal pl plate, which is um, an echo of the high priest's bre breastplate, is on the front of it. So much actually about this sort of Jewish life is taking elements of the temple and translating them in, a, in the synagogue. And so we don't have a high priest with a high priest's clothing. You have the clothing of the Torah, so you have the breastplate of the Torah, so the breastplate of the high priest. You have echoes, kind of abstraction, and then echo making a symbolic kind of visual reminder of that. Thank you. That was key. Um, there it goes. This is another example in terms of Jewish ritual life, but this is an allegorical wedding. Um, this is by uh, artist Ephraim Moses and it's the beginning of 20th century, and this is showing, um, it's a kind of, in the future, it's kind of a, one of those ones, so you have the exile, and then you have redemption, and in the middle you have a marriage. And you have, we know it's a marriage because of this. You've got four poles, and I've said you before about the white garment with the black stripes. Mm -hmm. So that prayer garment is often used to make, it's called a chuppah, the wedding canopy, mm -hmm. under which you stand when you get married. So it's, a, it's, and it's very, the, the wedding camp canopy, actually today you can see some really lavish ones, but it's basically the same thing. It's a white, it's not, it doesn't have to be white, it's a square with four poles under which the bride and groom stand with attendants. And that is under the, it's called under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy. And we use one of those when we have Jewish weddings today. And it's a very kind of important symbol and like various, Kind of stuff is said about kind of like your door should always be open, it's so symbolic, but also there's a symbolic covering between the man and wife that you're kind of performing one unit under this wedding canopy. And so this object, this ritual object, <coughs> is something that we use today, we still use today in today's Jewish weddings, and it's been appropriated by this artist to talk about this allegorical wedding, this wedding of kind of like this spiritual feminine. I'm not sure what the man in red rep who the man in red represents. He's got a nice dress. I like the sleeves. Um, but it's this kind of this wedding, this coming together of this of the masculine and the feminine. And this actually kind of coming together of a wedding of a love masculine and feminine is a very important concept in Jewish mysticism. That this bringing together of heaven of earth, of masculine and feminine, of of the spiritual and the physical that they come together and it's, it's this interpretation of the Song of Songs. And this mystical tradition has driven also a lot of influence to a lot of Jewish artists, um, including Rothko um, and others. And let's move on, please. <coughs> and so this, this is a contemporary artist, a man called Toby Khan, in terms of the mystical tradition um, informing Jewish art. Um, Toby Khan is actually an abstract painter he makes gorgeous, like huge canvases. They're very, uh, for a lot of them very contemplative. He's been working a lot actually in hospices um, and making kind of art, art in those places. This is actually an Omer calendar. The Omer is the period of time between the Freedom Festival of Passover, freedom from slavery, and then the festival of receiving the law, receiving the Torah, or Shavuot, also known as Pentecost. And that's, that period of time between that festival and that festival is seven weeks, mm -hmm. seven times seven, and there is a ritual counting of that time. You, you count those 49 days, and there's a ritual to count those 49 days. And Toby, and it's, it has a whole, then the mystical tradition is that it's this, your, your soul is being elevated and you're bringing together the masculine, the feminine, the heaven and the earth together during those, during those seven weeks. And for Toby, he made this um, Oma calendar, and it's these sort of chunks that kind of come out and you put in, and you can put 
put them in various ways in the shadow and the way the light forms on that. And so he has taken the ritual of counting and his art practice and made something new. And so he's using the kind of the discipline of what it means to make art, to make an arresting uh, visual image, a visual object, with the practice of the counting. And he sees this kind of this Jewish life as performance, as like performance art. And, and, he, and it brings the two together. Yeah, it's seven by seven. It's seven by seven, exactly. Exactly. And that's his on my calendar. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is actually one of my work. Um, again, I, I mean, I've done on my calendars as well, but this, I wanted to show you this. There is a practice within the Jewish ritual of mourning that as part of the funeral, the main, the principal mourner, um, so that's the kind of the child or the spouse or the um, parent, if, if, you know, if, if it was a child who got disease, that they would rip their clothes before the funeral starts. And there's a ripping that goes on. And it's coded kind of like, depending on who, which loved one it is, like where your clothing is ripped. And then during the seven days after the funeral, there's a seven day sitting and mourning and people come to give comfort to the mourners. And the, the Jewish law is, is that you should wear that ripped garment for that seven days. And the understanding is, is that anybody who comes and sees you in your time of grief shouldn't have to ask, oh, how are you? They should look at you and they'll know because they see that rip and they know what your internal emotional state is. They know that something has been ruptured. Something has been torn in your life. And that is expressed in your clothing. So before any words are mentioned, because it's quite hard to ask somebody who's just lost somebody they've loved, how are you? You know, you can see it, and hopefully you have empathy. And so that's the function of this. And so I took this ritual of tearing, and, I, and this is from a series of clothing pieces where I looked at the different ways in which clothing is used as a vehicle for meaning within our tradition. There's many different ways. Mourning is just one of them. But I looked at this and I, th I thought about what, what are the other emotions associated with mourning. And I made this garment. So we have this sort of metal choker, you know, for that time when you just feel very choked up. There's a whole kind of a, there's a hole sort of punched in. And then the left sleeve, the arm nearest the heart, is sort of ripped to shreds. And the right sleeve is intact. And on the cuff there, I've written the special prayer that the mourner says. Now, the special prayer that the mourner says hasn't actually got anything to do with death. And it hasn't got anything to do with mourning. The special prayer that the mourner says is just about praising God. That's all it is. It's a public praising God. And it's like this t time of feeling that you have all been ripped up. And who knows what you really think about God at that time. It's you have to stand there and do this prayer. And it's, it, it's a very difficult one to do. And I know many people struggle with it. And that's why I've embroidered it on the right cuff, because it's a kind of aid memoir, because those words aren't going to come easily to you. And nevertheless, the tradition is saying you need to say them anyway. You need to, move, you need to kind of know how to be ripped up and also open your mouth and try to praise God. You need to try and do both. And so that's what this garment was really exploring, is like this contrast inside there of what someone goes through in mourning. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce you to Ben Schachter. This is another, um, I think he, I don't, he was in New York, I'm not sure where he is now, um, artist and also art historian professor. He made this pieces which are embroidery. This is actually an embroidered line, embroidery on, on paper, um, of something called the Erev. Now the Erev is um, the boundary line that is a bit of a rabbinic fiction. So on our Sabbaths, we're not allowed to carry in public areas. And so what, what has been kind of, what they said is like, fine, but you can carry in private areas and semi-private. So how do you make an area semi-private? And that is by sharing. When the community shares together, so we all have, so we share food. And we make a sort of symbol that actually we are connected and we can come in and out of each other's houses and share resources then that what it becomes public becomes semi-private and we share that space and so this Arab is a way of doing that kind of in cities and there's an there's a couple of Arab areas of london that has an Arab 
It's nothing that you would notice because a lot of it is just like a symbolic, very thin wire that, that is there. And it's just this kind of symbolic thing because as the other meshes have, have gone in about how we share space together and about sharing resources. And he sort of taken city maps and he's done this very fine embroidery of this very fine line that kind of makes a difference. And when you have a community that has these, it means that, that the life slightly subtly shifts. And it subtly shifts mainly for the women in these communities because often they're the ones, if you weren't allowed to carry, they're the ones stuck at home with the young children. And if you are allowed to carry, you can put that you can carry your kids, you can carry the nappies, you can have it. And it, and it means that the Judaism and the Jewish life becomes something much more livable. And that's the rabbinic project, is to take this and make it, how do we live? So this is a couple of Israeli artists um, and it's called, this particular piece is called Chavruta or Matuta. And it's set out like a chessboard. And Chavruta or Matuta means fellowship or death, which William Morris apparently also quoted, but it comes from the Talmud first. Um, and it says fellowship or death. And it's this project of you are connected with people or you die. And this connection with people, with another person, is an integral part of Jewish learning. So you have, and in the Talmudic discussions, often it's debates between two rabbis, or three or different generations of rabbis, but the idea of you have a conversation, you have a dialogue, you have an engagement, or you just wither. You either kind of, you, you can't be alone. And, it's forced, and, so, and sometimes that conversation can be quite adversarial, and that's why they've got this lovely kind of chessboard here. And they've also taken these symbols, which are um, kind of often, which are very similar to what some religious Jewish men wear on their heads, called a kippah. And so they've, they've taken these sort of kippah, this, this, which often were worn by religious Jewish men, and they've made a chessboard out of it. So again, it's taking that aspect, that object of Jewish life, the men's head covering, this concept in Jewish learning to make an art piece about that. Um, so a bit, a bit more. They, those were Israeli artists who did that. The other ones I showed you myself were American artists. That's another Israeli artist called Rafi Lavi. Now Rafi Lavi describes himself as a secular Israeli, uh, but um, he's becoming as he's getting as he got older, but much more aware actually he's Jewish, of his Jewishness. And what does it mean to be Israeli and his Jewishness? And the Jewishness creeps in. And this actually is a drawing. It's, he draws on like plywood or he'll take kind of quite ordinary things and make these kind of very beautiful, subtle drawings with them. Uh, the, uh, there's an art, a uh, very interesting art theorist, writer called David Sperber in Israel. And he writes about the Jewishness of Israeli art, including Israeli secular art, that it has a Jewish twist, that it's there, it's ingrained within that. And you have Israeli artists who will say, no, 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 they're not Jewish, it's not, it's not, it's not there. But he kind of like, it comes in anyway. And so Rafi Lavi is a kind of now older, and he's kind of acknowledging that, the influence in his work. Can I have the next one, please? And this is a younger Israeli artist called Adi Ness. He's a photographer based in Tel Aviv. Um, grew up in actually quite a poor development town in Tel Aviv. Um, very much, uh, there's a lot of stuff about him that he's sort of alienated, um, not only just sort of from this poor town, but he's also gay, and kind of how that fits, makes his kind of identity fit in with Israeli society. Uh, we're going back to kind of looking at how these artists are using Christian iconography in their works. So we've got this fantastic Last Supper um, here. Um, and it's fascinating to think of this. It's sort of the Last Supper, and sometimes it's tagged the Last Supper before going into battle. Um, and they kind of wonder, like, what's the, the Judas, like, what, what he is he in terms of translated to the Israeli army kind of world. And it's a very strong, arresting image. And all his, he makes his, his images, they're huge. They're like huge canvases when they get printed. Um, and they're beautifully staged and meticulously lit and photographed. Um, I, rem I went to a talk of his and he was talking that even the outside light is also staged. It's all, it's all kind of, uh, it's all there. And the next one. This is a series of his from the, um, he did a series from, from, from stories from the Bible. And this is his Abraham and Isaac. This is the sacrifice of Isaac. 
the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, of Abraham being told by God to take his son up to the mountain. Um, and this is his interpretation. And he, sa- he situated these series of Bible, stu- of Bible studies, these, these photographs, um, in poor development towns in Israel. So in the poor, in the ignored, in the marginalised, those were the people and the setting for his, for his biblical characters. And you have, and I, I find this incredibly powerful. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, and this is his David and Jonathan, um, which I love. Let's go on, because I'm realising I'm running out of time. This is another young uh, Israeli artist called Michal Barat Kain. She also, very similar stages, photographs, similar to Adiness, but her emphasis is actually looking at the women of the Bible and the overlooked women of the Bible. This is the Queen of Sheba. Um, and so you actually see non-white Jews um, in there. And, and her work is, is stunning. Have the next slide. Um, so just talk a bit now, but just a little bit about feminist art, Jewish feminist artists, of which I kind of, I kind of feel to fit into that category. Um, and because... David Sperber, this art historian, when he talked about the Jewish twist of Israeli art, these Israeli artists were taking the Jewish tradition and often challenging it in, in their work as well. And he was asked, well, what about the religious artists? Are they doing that as well? And David responded, yes, they are. It's the women. It's the feminists. The, Ju- the Jewish religious feminist artists are doing that same sort of challenging approach. And he put it on a show called Matronita. Matronita was an important lady, uh, this sort of Roman lady in, in, in the Talmud, mentioned a lot in the Talmud. Uh, one of the main artists in there is this woman called Helene Ayalon, who, um, fascinating background, she grew up very religious, Hasidic. Her, unfortunately, her husband died when she was in her 20s, um, and she was heartbroken, and a lot of her work has been coming from that anger and frustration. Uh, and this is the book that will not close, and she put a sheet of paper in between the various pages of the Bible and took a pink highlighter and highlighted all the things she found problematic in terms of how they treated the widow and how they treated women and how they treated how, how that's talked about. And it will not close. It's, no, it's like you cannot close the book on this. You have to engage with it. You have to debate it. You have to go through it. You have to churn it over. So this is Helene. What's the next one? This is Andy Arnowitz. Um, she's uh, another Israeli artist. She's a, actually a good friend of mine. She, um, this is taking wedding... Um, She's taken old wedding documents and has torn them up to sew them. This is the, the coat of the Agunar. The Agunar is a woman who, for some reason, the husband won't really give a divorce, even though he's left her. And so she's stuck in a very difficult situation. She's in a trap marriage. So, yeah, I think so. Um, this is actually one of my paper cuts where I've taken different um, rabbinic texts, which are very problematic in how they portray women, and I've mixed them with these images and this is about talking about modesty that women should really be modest in terms of how they dress and how they are because it, they should be hidden um, and I pulled them out I don't want them to be hidden so um, I'm going to finish off talking about this project now which is my current project which is this Talmud project because I often get this sense of like when I look over it and especially they're kind of looking at the feminist um, lens of the uh, and the artists who also and we often get asked well why do you stay why do you stay as part of the what is your faith what is why are you still there um, and it's a really good question and it's what I often ask um, and I started this project so the Talmud is this huge book if you learn a page of Talmud every day it will take you seven and a half years to go through the whole thing. And I know that because that's what I am now doing, and I'm about halfway through. And I'm learning a page of this Talmud, and I'm um, doing a drawing in response. And the Talmud contains law, it contains stories. It is the source text for that, shape, that has shaped um, what the definition of, Ju- of Judaism today. It comes after the destruction of the temple, it comes after the biblical period. It contains stories, a law, and everything from that, but this very much is the definitive one. And when I was doing it, you had this picture here with the eye open. This is a prayer that's it's taught, discussing a prayer that's normally said when you cover your eyes, that actually I wanted to engage with my eye fully open. I wanted to kind of not be like Wagner saying, no, that eye can't produce. Now, I wanted to train my eye to look and to be fully open to the text and the world and engage in that way and engage visually with this text. So these are examples of my Talmud drawings. And the Talmud is divided up into different sections. 
and each section of the Talmud I'm drawing in a different drawing medium and what I've noticed is that as I'm drawing in that particular medium it's making me think very differently and so the making is influencing the thinking because I'm making something in collage is not going to be the same thought processes as when I'm making something in pencil because I'm now thinking differently and it's thinking about how can that access to the visual open up new worlds of meaning. Thank you. Um, actually, I can skip on to the next one. <coughs> I'm going to finish off with this image. And this is, this, this is a still from a film that I made about... I was commissioned to make a film with a musician about the Jewish mystical experience. And the, sto- the text we were given, um, which is from the Zohar, which is this Kabbalistic mystical text, um, starts with two friends meeting. They've been on a journey and they meet. And one of them has met an a old man who talks in riddles. And the two of them have this conversation with the old man and they decipher the riddles and in their conversation they enter worlds and they they discover that actually the secret of it all is to find, it's uh, it's to find the feminine, it's to find the female embodiment of Torah, of wisdom, of God and to seduce her and to stand naked before her. On the next slide. There we go. And it's, it's to find, and she's locked in a tower, and the, the scholar has to go and find her and has to go there. And it's that engagement, that trying to discover the meaning and trying to get to the hidden layers, which is what that whole journey is. Um, actually, I'm going to ask you to go to the next, next one. And she is described as the maiden with no eyes, but who is surra- and the eyes. Um, yeah, and she's maiden with no eyes, but she, but she sees everything. So it's this kind of, like she has this little eyeball necklace there. So it's, again, it's this kind of engagement with the visual that is going to really kind of get to the heart and find that sort of, the fe- and bring out that female quality that is really there, and if only you can look for it. So thank you. Thank you.